good day, good good evening if you're in the US, good morning if you're on this side of the world, all like like the whole panel really. Um, welcome to Questions as Mechanics, the power of asking and answering. Um, we this is a this is an amazing panel that uh, we've got set up for you with a lot of amazing panelists. So just before we start, just want to thank uh, Metatopia for having us. Thank you for showing up. And uh, with that, we'll get started. I'm I'm Thomas Manuel. I use he him pronouns. I'm an indie game designer from India. And uh, I also uh, write a newsletter, a weekly newsletter about indie RPGs, uh, which you can find at ttrpg.substack.com. It's a really nice, fun thing for you to kind of uh, follow. And then like I curate whatever happens in indie RPGs. Uh, that's me. Um, Aaron, do you want to go next? Yeah, sure. Thanks for asking me that question, Thomas. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm Aaron Lim. Uh, I'm a uh, tabletop game designer uh, based in Malaysia. I hear him pronouns as well. Uh, and uh, most of my stuff that I do, I have uh, almost all of it up on uh, itch.io. Uh, so it's at aaronlime.itch.io, E-H-R-O-N-L-I-M-E. -E. It's just a very weird misspelling of my name, um, which a lot of people don't realize until I mention it. Uh, uh, that's pretty much it. I, I, I make start like different games, story games, small games, shit post games. Um, uh, that's, that's me. Hi, so, uh, I'm Jamie. My pronouns are he, they, and I endeavor to be one of the himbos in the TTRPG space. I'm here to cheer everybody on and play games with everyone. So I like to make games too. Uh, you can find my games at temporalhiccup.itch.io. I used to have a problem where I used to try to join every game jam. The last year, I've been very good. Uh, I slowed down. But my biggest projects right now are things like Apocalypse Keys, Once More Into the Void, and Our Haunt, which is currently on Kickstarter. So if you want to check that out, um, that would be cool. Uh, yeah, that's that's. I'm sure I'm forgetting something, but it'll come up later. <laughs> I'm sure. So Logan, do you want to go next, darling? Why, yes. Thanks, Jeremy. Um... Yes, I'm Logan, he, him pronouns, I'm from Australia, I'm trans. Um, here to talk about games, so I should mention my games related things. You can find my games uh, on breathingstories.itch.io and follow me on Twitter at um, ink underscore and underscore stories, where I just talk a lot about tabletop stuff all the time at every given opportunity. I'm going to pass to you, Mamedos. So I'm Omeros, like all of them. The common fact is I'm also an indie game designer. You can find most of my works at omeros.com. My biggest project has been ARC, but even before then, I was already loving making lots of different games, story games, OSR inspired. But my biggest, proudest project has been the across-rpg, across-rpgc.com, where there is a lot of Southeast Asian games that you can discover for yourself. Thank you for having me here. Yeah, across RPGC is really amazing. I uh, I recommend everyone go check it out. Uh, uh, Momitos, why don't uh, you kick us off? So this is a, this is going to be a question that I that is just common for everybody. But uh, Momitos, when I sort of like mentioned this panel, uh, what about questions as mechanics uh, got you excited to participate? How do you use questions in your games? Well. Obviously, the first thing that really made me excited about the panel was, of course, um, having you pitch it and hearing who I would be uh, being on the panel with. But also, for me, I find questions open a lot of possibility for players not just to passively receive information, but to also participate in the act of co-authoring. So they could inject their own flavor, their own story into the question and making sure that the content is customized to the world of their choosing. So that's why I thought, oh, heck yes, questions as mechanics. I really love that topic. Awesome. Uh, Logan, same question. Love it, yeah. So um, totally agree with everything Mamedo said about opening a lot of uh, possibilities and inviting in participation. Participation, But one thing I love about questions is that you can get really focused on a particular thread. So like, um, and you can get, you know, you can have broad questions like, you know, where did you last time travel to? And then you can get really narrow, like, at what point did you realize that you could never travel back to January 26, 1904? And then, that, you know, that's like, yeah, you know, so questions have a lot of power to really 
dive into lots of really interesting GC detail. Jamie? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, and this is something that has come up before because questions as mechanics is something that naturally comes up in story games and in a lot of indie games, right? Because like like Bim mentioned that that collaborative aspect is so important. But I think what's really interesting is deciding on your style. Like, let's say if you're a GM and you're bringing in questions, how how much are you going to give, right? So personally, I like to front load like some interesting tidbits just because I feel like it helps the players like latch on to something, right? That they can they can also get into. But there are other GMs who prefer just much more broader questions. So uh, for example, one of my favorite questions when someone wrote a miss when we were playing Fashones, Fashon de los Fashones was uh, when, when this mysterious woman with an eye patch comes out with a gun, right? Uh, the, the, the question I asked was, when was the last time you saw her and why did you break up? Right. And so like people are like, oh, <laughs> right? and that was a result of a miss because in Fashion does Fashion is right. Like a miss means that you must have had a relationship at some point. So, nice. uh, <laughs> but yeah. Um, Adam. Uh, yeah, everyone has like, such like interesting practical answers to this. So I'm going to be the one that has the um, wonky, wanky kind of like theoretical answer, which is that uh, I think why I was really interested in, in, in questions is mechanics, because I think that um, in tabletop RPGs, most mechanics are questions uh, and that like tabletop RPG design is like pretty interesting and unique in that like most of what you're doing is is asking asking and answering questions. So I feel like questions as mechanics is like a very fundamental part of like RPG design. Um, uh, and it's also kind of like uniquely an RPG thing in that like how you ask questions and how you answer them, how you're able to answer them um, compared to something where in like board games where like questions are like super restrictive, like the the mechanical things that they are asking is very restrictive. Um, and in a lot of like video games, for example, like the way you answer questions is a very kind of like predefined for you. Um, and tabletop RPGs have this like really great um uh, feature of like the way you you interact with questions is like pretty unique to it um and and how we kind of like deal with questions all the time while we are running games while we are playing um like all of that is just like asking and answering questions like what it like uh, when you know when you talk about like a, a a game is a conversation right um a lot of what drives the conversation forward is like hey you know there's 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 um agreements there's like expansion but then a lot of what when you reach like tension points when you can't not not necessarily that you can't agree but you can't sometimes you can't even see like the same world uh fictional world that someone else is seeing then you elaborate on that or or um uh like twist things around using questions and like figuring out together um even in like the most like like authoritative so to speak gm way like the 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 core question is still can i do this or what happens if i do this like it it still comes down to like questions so like i i i think it's really interesting uh topic to to cover because like, i feel like it's a very fundamental building block of like tabletop rpgs yeah i just wanted to say aaron i was i was prepared for a shit post of an answer, then you went professor on me. I'm very upset. Is this is this some sort of tactic? <laughs> anyway, that was an excellent point. I just wanted to say that. Yeah, um, yeah. This is a point that uh, I think Aaron and I have talked a lot about before. Uh, I think generally, I think what Aaron's saying is like more true of story games. Um, I think we're going to talk about all the ways story games use questions, though. Um, all RPGs, it is true partially. But it does feel like, to some extent, if you have a trad play style, um, so yeah, this. So I just yeah, I'm just flagging this for the audience also that this is going to be about story games. If you have another play style, I don't know how much of this is going to be relevant. It might be very interesting. It might not. Like it feels like in a trad play style, like the only real questions are like, what do you do? Uh, in the sense, what the GM asks the players, right? Like, what do you do? How do you want to do this? You know, things like that. And uh, in an OSR play style, which I know a lot less about, I could be wrong. There's 
all the questions can be going from the players to the GM, like what happens if I do this? Is there something here? You know, things like that. Uh, but in in story games, uh, there is like seems to be like a wider variety and a wider usage of questions and um, turning the conversation into mechanics. So um, my first question is for Momentos. Uh, you mentioned uh, in your uh, in your in your brief answer that you know there's this the questions allow us to like co-write. Like I think that's like super interesting. Like co-author, co-write, like the fiction um, and uh, <clears throat> like Aaron uh, said, it kind of like builds some kind of shared understanding, right? Like, is there, um, like, is this something that you have like used in your games or when you play, like, how do you, how have like you used questions? Yeah, I think uh, in art, one of the biggest ways questions have been pivotal was in making sure that the expectations were shared at the very beginning. So it's not an in-session mechanic per se, but a mechanic even at the very start to make sure that the rest of play is aligned with what everybody wants with the game, that they know this is the world you want to play it, this is the kind of heroes you want to be in, and this is how we met. But in previous games as well, um, I've used questions as options. Like you have two options. You either became somebody's mentor or you became somebody's lover. And then for each of these options, there is you met this lover. How did you meet and what did you do on the first date that embarrassed you, but then turned out to be quite nice. And of course, in an unreleased game, there is even more pointed questions like, why is your secretary the only human being you connect with anymore? So it, it does depend because yeah. of questions having a functional utility, making sure that understandings are equal among players to more pointed hinting at specific flavors that the characters are expected to embody. So I like the fact about questions that they can serve different purposes from the very baseline of what do you want to do next up to the very end of um, this is a laser that will shoot your enemy. What is their name? Or this is a laser with your enemy's name written on its bullet. Assuming lasers have bullets. <laughs> Laser bullets are the best. So. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you. That was great. Uh, Logan, I think, I think, I think in preparing for Paris, you used questions in a similar way to kind of like draw uh, players together. Do you, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, yeah. Echoing my mentors, how questions have lots of different uses. Um, one use that questions have is to yeah guide players to take certain actions. Um, yeah, as as mechanics in that way. So preparing for Paris in the um, the pre preparing for Paris is a game where you are all high school students, but you're all personified sports, and you're all trying to graduate top of the class to become real Olympic sports. And so, in the end of each uh, year of school together, you ask each other questions. Um, and the questions are like, uh, did I impress you this year? Did I better myself this year? Um, and depending on how many yeses you get, um, it, it basically allows you um, to, to level up or gain some mechanical advantage to your next year. So these questions are uh, in character, but they also have a uh, mechanical influence uh, in, in bettering your stats. So um, without explicitly saying so, uh, it drives the players to want to play in such a way that those uh, that their characters will get yes as the answer um, so that they can level up. And each of these questions, um, if you were to answer yes, it means that you've connected more with the other characters or you've put in an effort to get to know them or, um, yeah, tried to build relationship with them. So, yeah, questions can yeah, act as, as guides as well, um, which is, yeah, another way on top of what Mamete has already stated. I think I think that's 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 really interesting what you said because like I think in uh, in another game you can imagine like choosing your stats first and then there being some kind of dissonance where you realize in play that you what you actually want to do is roll your like worst stat all the time or something like that. Whereas if there are explicit questions that ask you like what do you want to do during the game and you are like forced to like come up with that answer that in character creation like I can imagine that. Uh, kind of eases the dissonance between like what you want to do and what you actually end up doing. Um, so that's really cool. Um, Jamie, just building on like what Aaron said about like games having like 
questions, like all games, even video games, having like questions like baked into them and things like that. Um, I know Apocalypse Keys has questions uh, like this. Do you want to talk about the 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 explicit questions that you have, and also uh, the 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 implicit questions that the that the game has? Ah, yeah, I could really relate to what Aaron was saying in terms of like the questions because. As a game designer, I feel like you're constantly asking yourself questions like, what do I want the players to do? Uh, what do I want them to experience? How do I want to invite them into that space? So with Apocalypse Keys, uh, which is about monsters that are holding back the apocalypse that may become harbingers themselves if they're not careful. And so it's a game of having a lot of power at your disposal, but not necessarily the control that you need to to use that power and also needing each other, right? So there are a lot of emotional questions that are built into the game. Uh, I have been wonderfully accused of uh, secretly making Apocalypse Keys a polycule simulator. Uh, it has been called Apocalypse Kisses. So, uh, and the reason this is the case is because, for example, when you play the last, which is the last of their kind, whoosh, explosion kiss is the best. Uh, one of the questions you have to answer is, uh, you know of another like me, how does keeping the secret from me protect me, right? So the assumption is you are supposedly the last of your kind, but there's another PC that knows that's not true. And, but the implicit, so every time I craft a question, I also try to have an implicit question that's not said out loud, which is, um, why do you think it's best to keep that secret from me? Like what, what made it, impossible to tell it to me right so and then another question that the last asks is we loved each other once why do we keep hurting each other right and so the implicit question is what is it that hurts me and what is it that hurts you so i think those are i like asking questions that already start leading to other ones that's definitely something that's important another way that there's a explicit question is so you work for the division and basically every time you pick up a division move, you answer, you choose one or three questions to answer and this fleshes out the division or it fleshes out your connection to what is mostly a human organization despite the fact that you are a monster. And usually the questions lead to the creation of a NPC or another character. Um, mostly if you play a jammy game, they're gonna be like lots of NPCs and uh, I feel like because as a GM, I'm sorry, as a, as a game designer, I feel like NPCs are really important to like prop up those mirrors. So I try to insert those opportunities to create NPCs as much as possible to create connections as much as possible. I also realized only recently, like in the last month, that 80% of the moves in Apocalypse Keys are pointed at another character. Uh, I don't know why it only occurred to me lately, <laughs> but, but yeah. And then so, but just to, to round it off in terms of like the implicit question, something that I did with Apocalypse Keys on purpose is, so it's a Powered by the Apocalypse game, which means it has several moves that will depend on the trigger, right? And so in some previous PPTA games, you would have to do a lot to like line up that trigger as much as possible to be able to use the move. But in Apocalypse Keys, because I asked the question to myself, like, how do I want the players to feel powerful? Then that means that it should be as easy as possible to trigger any of these moves, right? And so that's what I purposely did. And um, it takes a lot for, for GMs to get used to that, uh, to, to how much the players can just, like, throw around the narrative and the momentum, really. But that's the fun part about Apocalypse Keys. It's, it's meant to be... Uh, delightfully chaotic in that way. So, uh, yeah, but basically that's that's what I think about the implicit and explicit questions in game design. Nice. I think that's that's something we're going to, like, come back to, I think, again, later in the panel, like, this question of, like, like phrasing questions and the advantages of, like, how you phrase them. Uh, but, um, like, first, yeah, I want to I wanna throw to added this idea of, like, explicit and implicit questions again. Because I think earlier you mentioned that you know all games tend to have uh, tend to have like a question uh, baked into them that we are playing to find out, uh, but uh, but that isn't the same as 
uh, having having explicit questions like in the text, right? So what what is the what is the relationship between like those two things, and uh, is there some way that you use them in your games? Yeah. Yeah. Um... I realize I said like all games, right? Like it's, it's such a such a uh, provocative thing to say, like all games, like to make a claim about all games. Um, but like I, I think just just to clarify that I'm I'm not seriously making the the claim that all games do this, but I, I think it it's an interesting question to pose whether or not games like deal with questions in 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 a, in, in this way. Um, this is rhetoric, right? Like why why you make argumentation. Um, just, 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 I just, just wanted to clarify that because, like, uh, I don't want anyone atting me. Just like, hey, 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 you said all games are this. It's like, no, no, no. I'm using this as a, as a way to like, like, like discuss questions in games. Um, so in terms of like, like how to to step up from that like high level. Hey, what, what, a, what, what is a game about, right? Like that's like that's a very common question to have. Like, like Jamie, you mentioned as well, like. Um, in, in making Apocalypse Keys, you ask yourself like the question, or you want the GM to have the question, or like, hey, how do I make the players feel powerful or dangerous? Right? Two sides of the same coin. Powerful and power, power and danger is like the like very like interlinked things. Um, so that's like a question that the game asks. Um, and I was I, I read a, a, a an interesting thing. Um, uh, Vincent Baker, I believe, recently wrote something about like, hey, uh, trying to figure out like what uh games to 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 um for like a scoring rubric for, for like school uh like you know if you did an independent project about games for school and then and that led me to like 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 i think what he was writing about like oh what is the the key question about like uh apocalypse world is like oh what will you make of the world right and then um from that you can kind of like like figure out the questions that you ask in play that the explicit questions that you have uh either as like disguised as mechanics or not disguised, but like expressed as mechanics or literally written down as like like questions, right? Um, similarly, like like I think what what he said about like what D and D's common question is like how do you prosper in a dangerous world, right? Like that's a question that that that, that because like you know like there's no end goal. Uh, I think I think the the context he was coming from is there's no like win condition in 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 um a lot of tabletop RPGs. So what you're trying to do is just continually asking and answering this question. Like how do you prosper in a dangerous world is something that you can keep asking because like you if you prosper a bit then it's like okay now the world like continues to be dangerous or maybe the, the world is less dangerous. What does prosperity mean after that, right? What does it mean? Uh, like it changes the, the the same question gets asked again in like different ways. Um, so the way I think about it is that like and, and the way I I kind of like like try to distill something from like a very high level theory thing down to something practical in like game design is, is um to figure out like the the core questions that you're asking with the game, um and figure out. Uh, how you use the questions to kind of like reinforce and and uh, support like the the so-called core questions of the game, um, and so so the way the ways I, I I like doing that is like something that all the other panelists mentioned as well. Like questions can serve different um, uh, purposes, right? So often, what you want to do is you want to elaborate. Uh, questions are, are used to elaborate. Uh, questions are used to to um, Calibrate. I think some so that's something that I believe Momentus mentioned. Like you're trying to calibrate consensus around, like, hey, what are what are we playing together here? Um, what can we agree is is real? And 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 this is something that like uh, this is like a slight pushback. And this is the other thing that questions do is that questions can subvert and and surprise and and delight because you're you are introducing things that you wouldn't have thought of otherwise, right? Is to to instigate people to to think and imagine things that they might not have uh, if you hadn't asked the question. Uh, because like, if, if you're stuck in a way of thinking or like, it, don't even know that you're stuck, right? Okay, okay you, you, you realize that you're thinking in a certain way, a question can like help you expand on that. Um, and so so my, my subversion is that like, I think it's not just story games that like deal with questions, right? Like a lot of like traditional games and maybe even OSR games, um, there is a skill in like GMing well, GMing those games well, and it's about figuring out how to ask questions of the players. Um, I, I find that like the culture around like like traditional OSR 
makes those questions like the oh these are good questions to ask your, your players makes that not part of the text usually it becomes a thing of culture right about building play culture and building um uh game culture around a game like these this is how a game uh, a D and D game or like a, a a different like traditional game asks questions, but like it's never explicitly stated in in like a book or something like 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 that, right? It's like everyone finds their own style. That that's kind of like the appeal of, of that sort of game or like the the the, the thing that they sell. It's like oh, you you find your own style and then you you make it work, right? And one of the things the criticisms of story games is that it feels uh, restrictive if you provide a list of questions, right? Which again, I counted as like, no, it's not a restriction. It is an invitation. It is an invitation. It, 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 these questions are also subversions to try and like, hey, you might be asking the same questions all the time. Here are some new questions that you might use that you might not have thought of, right? Um, and so, so, so that's another thing that questions do. And then, and as a game, like, like what Jeremy and like Logan said, like as a game designer, you are asking questions of the game as well. You are asking questions about how you use questions in the game. Who gets to ask the questions? Who get, who gets to answer? How do they answer them? Right. Um, again, coming back, I, I go, come back to Vincent Baker a lot because like, I've been reading a bit of his, his stuff recently. Um, like he, he had a thing about like, like a lot of games, like you can, you can essentialize down. And again, you know, this is a, this is. I don't think it's a claim about all games, but like like trying to like figure out uh, 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 how to explain a game quickly is like oh you have a starting position, uh, you have a question about like how you would react to that, and you have the tools of like how you answer those questions. That's kind of like the basic three corners that you need to to, to for like every game. It's like what's the starting position? What are the questions you can ask? What are the tools to answer those questions? Right. Um, and so when you when you're designing questions for a game, if you keep thinking about like the other questions that you're asking high level and then figure out at the low level what your your specific questions are doing that subvert that su support that elaborate on like the other questions that you're asking in the game i think that's that's the way that i i think about like using questions that's like a like, more high level theoretical i don't have like concrete examples like everyone else here has um but yeah uh theory <laughs> sorry for the long answer no no that was that was Excellent a great answer, answer yeah. yeah that's really cool uh if i could also jump a bit on that because something that you said aaron about uh story games using questions and options as an invitation also made me realize that questions are like useful touch points for the players or the gm to know what is possible in the game and also what is being normalized in the game like when i play dnd for example something that i would always ask the gm or my fellow players would be how many more xp until the next level <laughs> is it safe to go into that dungeon so we we already ask those questions ourselves and even in OSR, where we try to go through exhaustive lists of scenarios, like if I press this panel, will something happen? If I use this 10-foot pole and I'm poking it far from away, is it going to be safe? So those kinds of questions, the normal palette of questions that we ask in games also helps build the expectations on what is a normal encounter for a session. And the power of providing unique provocative and consequential questions in a game is that it pushes you beyond the ordinary, beyond what is expected, and thinking, huh, I didn't think of it that way. That lasers could have bullets. <laughs> it's pretty cool. A hundred percent. I have to agree. Like, I think when, when questions show up, because this is something that I hear about, right? A lot of pushback, like, oh, story games are restrictive and stuff. But I think more like, it is a cultivation. It is a creative space that that a designer sets forth to offer the players. Like I think it says, I know that you're capable of creating stuff, but I'm offering this part. I'm offering these themes. I'm offering these ideas. And I'm asking you, how do you want to build off of them? Right. So rather than restrictive, I think it's just a it's just a path. Right. And there are several paths to take. And I cannot imagine every path for you. Like the thing with Apocalypse Keys, uh, I received some pushback in terms of like the mysteries that are offered because I, I offer like a very strong premise for each mystery. But then after that, it just completely opens up. And so people are like, oh, couldn't you like uh, 
like give what I'm supposed to fight or what I'm supposed to do. And I was like, well, it's because your players are answering all these questions about who their characters are. And the characters in Apocalypse Keys take up so much narrative space because they're such huge, larger than life characters that instead the implicit question in Apocalypse Keys is, so GM, you know, Keeper, how are you going to use all of these colors of the palette, right? And what kind of mystery do you want to create? So, and how are you going to keep in step with your players instead of thinking that you have to be above them or ahead of them? So once again, all those implicit questions that are not meant to be restrictive, but they're meant to encourage a new way to play, right? So. Oh, yeah. Um, that's a, a discussion is bringing a couple things to mind. Uh, we've been talking a lot around um, GM'd games and, yeah, questions from player to GM and GM to player and in that circle. But, um, yeah, what about GM-less games? I feel like questions are super important in GM-less games because they serve to drive the story forward a lot of the time. Um, and provide that guidance where a, is what a GM might do in a GM'd game. Yeah, so that just came to mind. Yeah, do you think like maybe that means the questions are an invisible GM that the designer mm. puts them in, into a game? <laughs> yeah, is the designer the GM? Is is the game? Uh, yeah, is the text the game? You know, it's very interesting to think about. Thinking about GMless games, I often think about it as playing with the designer, um, as the designer being in the text, and so. Yeah, it's it's a box a different conversation around the term GMless and GMful and symmetric and asymmetric play, but that's that's a different conversation. It's very interesting that you brought that up because uh, you made a game that was about you being, <laughs> yeah, the players taking the part of you as the designer. Um, so like, like I get you can see, I I don't know whether like like that 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 like had a a path from like how you got up to to making Logan the autobiographical game. Um, but like that is kind of like, like kind of what you're doing. Like you say, like yeah, yeah. There's no GM here. It's that's just me. <laughs> and you're. I hadn't, I hadn't thought about it that way. <laughs> that yeah, I have that view of of GMless games. But I mean, maybe subconsciously that fed in. No, uh, Logan. Let's just continue with what you were saying, right? Like, and there's been a lot of talk about explicit and implicit questions. Uh, like, I know you've made a game that was entirely made of questions. So like, and was, but my question to you is, were any of the questions that you explicitly spelled out the, re, the question that the game was asking or did you, were, were they, was that kind of like hidden? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so talking about the, the question that the game's asking being, uh, using, uh, Vincent's framework that, that Aaron mentioned earlier. So you have your starting state, your question and the, the tools to answer. So, uh, the game that I'm, that is fully questions. It's called, um, if you're lost, you can look and you will find me time after time, or just time after time for short. Um, and it's where two, uh, lovers are inherent, like they time travel inherently. They'll go to sleep one day and wake up and they're five and go to sleep and they're 27 and 83 and, and so on and so forth. Um, and then they realize that there's one person in their life that keeps showing up, uh, and they realize they either are, um, they're all, they will be, or are already in love with this person. And the two of them decide to try and uh, live linearly together. Uh, so the question is, um, yeah, can can you do that? Can you um, break the rules of time travel in your body and live together in a straight line uh, or a gay line or any kind of line that you want? Um, but the questions in the text are about uh, your relationship and experiencing that out of order. So questions like, um, you know, uh, today your partner makes you feel a wellspring of joy. How do they do it? And then you ask your partner, how did you, um, did you know I, I, I would be this happy? And then you ask yourself, how do I express this joy? Things like that. So it's asking your partner and asking yourself. So now all those questions are about the, the relationship that you experience, but not the, the core um, game itself. Interesting to think about. Oh, and uh, talking about questions as mechanics, like specifically, uh, making a two-player game where you talk to each other like that is that is that is a structure right like that is structuring the conversation like around questions and very kind of like that is a great example of of uh, of questions as mechanics um yeah just to say, yeah you're right it like really strips it right back to the idea of the a game being a conversation where you are uh, asking and answering questions sometimes in a less clear way but yeah it's like strips it right back and that's basically all you're doing there is a bit of like 
movement involved, but yeah, that's basically <laughs> it. Um, uh, momentos, I, I, one of the things that we kind of like discussed, like in the, in the brief, like prep uh, conversations that I had with everybody, uh, was this question of, um, like pressure when someone throws a really kind of, uh, elaborate and sophisticated question at you, like you feel a kind of pressure to come up with this like fantastic, elaborate, sophisticated answer back. And, uh. And, and when it's a leading question, right? When it is a question that has assumptions baked into it, like uh, uh, like questions that that tell you now that you are now in that you were in love with somebody, like for example, right? Like you know, uh, uh, like how how do you think about like mitigating that pressure, or like uh, like is it just a question of safety tools? Like how how do you think about that? I think that's a really fantastic question because um, we did discuss that the questions are powerful for providing a sense of co-authorship. But what if the, the player doesn't want to be an author? What if it, it's not a role that they felt that they were prepared for? And that's actually something that I've seen some pushback against the, the concept of being an anti-canon, the concept of being of, of the GM asking, OK, you see three hooded people, describe one of them to me. And I see some people say that um, it, it's not my job. I'm not. I don't want to think about that because I. I don't. I feel pressured, or I don't feel creative enough, or I feel like the spotlight is being placed onto me. So I think there is a lesson in there that you don't just bring this onto the player. There really does have to be buy-in, uh, whether in embedded in the text of your game, uh, preparing them when you were describing, say, a playbook, saying that this is the concept around the character and that these questions will help guide you so that it aligns to a team that would maximize the mechanical options available to you. So just making sure that there is a guidance that this is, will be expected is already a big jump in making sure that there is no unpleasant surprises as well. And it just really is difficult as well when you are the shy person in a group of extroverted theater people and you have a question and you feel you have to perform. So I do feel like, I don't know if I'm qualified to say this as an advice, but one wonderful thing about games like these is that you can start thinking about them um, even before going to the table, absorbing the questions, thinking about what it implies for the world. And having that session zero, that conversation with the rest of your play members is important as well. Having that reassurance that, hey, it's all right. All answers are valid. We all don't need to be Shakespeare here at the table. Yeah, and actually, I want to jump in and say, uh, as a GM who likes to ask pointed questions, right? Uh, so a few weeks ago, I was running Blades in the Dark, and the my player actually said, you know, I'm, I do have an answer, but I'm worried that I'm relying too much on tropes in order to give this answer. And, but I'll go ahead and give the answer. And, and, and as we played, so a few minutes later, he actually said, actually, can we, can we go back? Can we script change that? Like, I'm no longer happy with making it a tragic death. I'd rather that it's a, it's instead focused on the sibling that I left behind. I don't want to bring in something like that into the story. And so I do think that allowing players to know, like, if I ask you a question, I'm not expecting you to, to have the best possible answer in the moment. It's okay if we either explore the answer together or you ask someone for help, or you can just change your mind, right? It's the power of, like, we're not, I, I do think there's this weird pressure, right? It's a sort of like, I have to be an improv actor and I have to, you know, I have to like, but this is a game and this is a story that we're telling together and we can have a meta conversation as much as we like. Like a, a question I like to ask myself when I'm, when I'm a player is how much do I want my character to sound? Right. And I, I ask this out loud a lot, like just to, just to signal to people that I'm game for suffering, but I have to think about it. <laughs> so, but yeah, I just wanted to jump off. That's like excellent points that, uh, that have been brought up. Mm, and just one thing to add, Jamie, you touched on it as well around, um, yeah, what happens if a player gets a question and they, yeah, they're not sure how to answer or they're not comfortable to. Um, one thing, you know, I find that, you know, in the moment, I can't think of a super cool answer. I look to another player, like, well, what do you think? Or, you know, I'm open to suggestions as anyone, you know, throw it to the table. Because again, 
um, depending on the story and the team, you may feel more or less comfortable. But yeah, I often like to just look at the players around me like, I don't know, what do you think? And that's another great question. What do you think? What do you think happens next? And another... Yeah, I... Oh, sorry, go ahead, Eric. Uh, uh, I, I was just going to ask, like... It... I know I've been asking, doing a lot of like theoretical thing, but like like practically coming back down to 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 the ground, uh, like what's what's the ways that you can like support that of like not you know if if people are not comfortable, um, answering these like loaded questions or like doing a lot of work answering the questions, like what what are the ways that you can like frame your questions in in that that's or, or maybe giving different op options for questions that can support that. Yeah, yeah. Ooh, that's an, I was gonna bring that up. That's... We're psychically linked, Aaron. Oh, no, because I was going to connect to how how Mamedo's brought up that if you already start building in questions during sessions there, like when you make a character and other things, it sort of primes people. Like, this is a game where we ask you questions, right? So, uh, but also to your point, Aaron, like, I also love to ask questions, but I think what is also a great thing to attach to that is to offer options, right? So the, the, the venerable pick list or the, the table we like to row on, right? Whatever, however we want to interpret it. So for example, uh, in my game called Through a Mirror Darkly, which is currently still a Patreon exclusive because I'm still working on it. But basically it's a, it's a sci-fi horror game, uh, belonging outside belonging. And so one of the, when you first create the ship, um, I tried to make it like, I tried to provide the different options so that they could get the themes of horror. And also it's hard to come up with horror in the moment, right? And so I wanted to give people um, things that they can do. So one of the questions is, what is at the heart of the ship? And one of the options is evidence that God exists that must be kept hidden, right? And so I will say that almost always got picked in playtests, right? And the reason was because people are like, what is the evidence that God exists? But also, why are we hiding it? <laughs> right? So, but anyway, but but that provides that space for people who are like, ah, I want to answer the question, but I don't want to lean too much on tropes. And, you know, I feel really pressured. But if I have a pick list, right? If I have options that still provide, and I and I always like include one option that's like, it's up to you, but I give it a little flavor, right? Just so that, you know. But but just to encourage people to make stuff up if they like it. But but yeah, definitely. Yeah, having that options, even just having a binary option already helps a lot. It's something that I've explored as well. Um, there was a game where you encounter questions throughout the life stage, and those questions are choices of something like you start a completely new activity or initiative. What do you kickstart? Or you can pick a legacy project has been handed over to you, how do you enhance it? So it's fairly simple, but already giving that option makes it much easier for them not to feel trapped in a specific um, question. And something that I really loved about this game as well is that the questions evolve as you play. So because it's a life journey, the questions are fairly happy, optimistic, like you're starting a new project, you're being promoted at work. And then by the end, it's like um, another important opportunity slips you by. Uh, what was it versus um, somebody dumps you and then how do you um, bounce back from it? So I also love to think that questions are powerful at the beginning, but they should also have the opportunity to grow throughout the game. Like they don't just have to be a static pick list, that pick list could eventually evolve through time and through play. Like when you level up, when you reach the end, or when you achieve some really exciting objective. A quick note, we have about 15 minutes left, so I was going to grab a question from chat. But we've had a lot of discussion about kind of a lot of the explicit questions that games can ask, and we've uh, there's been some allusion to how you know the game itself, the mechanics, the how the game is built can ask some of these questions. And so we have a question from Mo asking, how do you mechanically encourage? You were talking about uh, implicit versus explicit questions. How do you mechanically encourage or teach good questions? And I guess like what defines a good question to players in a way that less puts less pressure on them you know that is more subtle in a way because it's the mechanics that are asking not necessarily the book or the text uh 
That's super interesting. So just to, I'm just going to reiterate the question so it's clear in my mind. So how do we um, mechanically encourage players to ask good questions? Um, yeah, during game. Interesting. Okay. I mean, yeah, pick lists, for example, if they have a pick list that they can use for um, inspiration um, so that they're choosing the questions as an element of choice. Um, but still, you know, it's still coming from the game. So it feels like, oh, if it's in the game, then it must be a good question. That's the first idea that comes to mind. Yeah, I think in terms... Oh, sorry, Aaron, go ahead. Oh, no, sorry. Uh, just to kind of build on that, like, in a way, um, the way Apocalypse World and like Powered by the Apocalypse games like have um, the player principles uh, or, or like... GM agenda that actually usually is a way to like guide towards good questions because like hey these are the things that that um should be important to you or like should be important or like these are the pillars that that I thought of when designing the game um you can like adjust the pillars for your game like for example I th I think in Forge in the Dark games like uh, or in Blades in the Dark specifically it's like oh yeah one of the pillars is that it's a dangerous life but you can change that pillar you can have a less dangerous ga games of Blades. And that affects how you ask the questions. So instead of asking like, hey, this this person is going to do things to you, uh, resist it. It's just like, you know, you change how bad a thing is, right? Like one of the the, 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 the key uh, uh, things that like, I think it's just like having a, a explicit understanding of like, like if you understand the context of like asking questions, then it, it empowers you to ask better questions. I think, I think that's like the, the, the first step. Yeah, yeah, that's that's that absolutely makes a lot of sense. And I think um, in terms of the implicit questions that are in the mechanics that are not being asked out loud all the time, I think I first saw something like that when I was playing The Veil, which is also a Powered by the Apocalypse game. But instead of having stats that are attached to moves, instead what happens is you have emotion, right? And so the question, the question that the game always asks you is, I know what you're doing, I know what move you want, but how do you feel about it? Right. And so it really created it helped create this like really like cool cyberpunk emotional story that I like really it really dove into the North thing. As a GM, I was always asked, yes, yes, I know you want to beat him up, but how do you feel about it? Right. And so I would get really amazing answers like sad because I'm flashbacking to this moment where I had to learn that violence is always the answer. Right. I was like, oh, so good. Um, and so in Apocalypse Keys, there is a similar thing where instead of stats, you have darkness tokens that you can collect. And so the question is always, how many darkness tokens are you going to invest knowing that you can go too far? Because in Apocalypse Keys, and, and this is a mechanic from Liberté, uh, which is a really cool game. If you hit an 11 plus, you end up having a disastrous success. Like you can't quite control your powers. You can't quite control the outcome. And you're aiming for an eight to 10, which is a perfect success. So it's really fun to see in the game where people are like, oh, how much am I going to invest? But is it better to go too far rather than missing, right? And so there's a there's that small question that gets easier and easier, or sometimes harder and harder to answer, uh, which I really and that's a nice implicit question that's not said out loud but is brought about by by mechanics. But just to add to that, mine may be a bit more of an engineering analytical framework. But if it's players doing the asking and we want to encourage them to ask a more meaningful or more delightful questions or even questions that can help them in a dungeon in D&D or, or OSR, one useful method that they could use is figuring out what are the known unknowns and the unknown knowns. So basically, you will be confirming, okay, I'm not sure if there is an enemy behind that door. So that is a known unknown. I know that that is something I don't know. So maybe I could ask a question about that. And then you could also ask questions about things you're, you're kind of sure, maybe, but you don't have conclusive data to support it, the unknown knowns. So you feel like that person is a baddie. You have a strong gut feel, but maybe you can just ask a few more questions to lead up to a more conclusive, definitive answer for that. So, but this is basically the analytical approach to it that's informed by like design thinking, taking a stock of what you know, what you don't know, and what you want to know, and then bridging that gap. But on the more creative side, really the best way to know what kind of questions to ask 
is to explore media, read books, have many wonderful experiences so you know what to expect and you broaden your perspective and possibilities a little bit more. Yeah, exactly what I was going to say actually is like the, the best way to like ask good, good questions uh, is to figure out and calibrate what you think a good question is. And to do that, you steal. You steal everywhere. You steal widely. You steal from like media, from books, from comics, from, from operas, from plays, from technical writing manuals, right? You steal questions from everywhere. Like when, whenever, you know, go, 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 go read like journalist questions and like how they, they like uh, trick people into revealing more of, of, of like what, what they wouldn't have otherwise, right? Or like, like examine like different stories. Like when, when Jeremy was talking about like, you know, being wary of tropes, it was like, oh, I don't want to give the tropey answer. Sometimes give the tropey answer because like that's, they, that a lot of people have explored these tropes and like ask different questions about it. And maybe like if you, if you know, that might like push you to like ask, like see if you can ask a question that hasn't been asked before, right? Like take a question from a soap opera game and ask it in a in a in a dungeon delving game, right? Like taking things into different contexts, like um, that. That's kind of like one one way that you can like get more exciting questions. Yeah, I do want to say you know that YouTube show about the hot wings guy, like he makes celebrities eat hot wings. He asks really good questions. I just want to point that out. So. <laughs> Do we have any more questions, Lucas? We got a few more. Uh, no, it's about 10 more minutes. So what one is that um, kind of differencing games from other mediums that also ask questions in various ways that like literature, for example, is very good at asking questions of a reader at like posing a question to you that you have to think and ruminate on. But there is something to games where games make you not only hear the question, but have to make an answer or rather to to make decisions and so how do games as a medium deal with the questions not just the asking of them but the requiring of answering or the not requiring but knowing that you will at some point how, uh, making decisions instead of answering asking questions necessarily i think i think the interesting thing about games is that uh like if there is an implicit question like you don't answer it usually, you just, you work your way through it. Like even if you have not cogently kind of sat down and like formulated a response, like by playing, you end up with a response that you can look back on and kind of uh, in hindsight, like talk about and discuss. And I think also as a designer to think, these are the questions I'm asking, but what is the mechanical output that I expect from the players? Right. And so maybe attaching and like whatever answer comes out, this will be the mechanical output, even if that means a narrative mechanical output. Right. Just so that people can see that that byline. Right. would also help. Yeah, I think one, one thing to add is just like how, how we approach answers. Right. Like uh, uh, and making decisions is like is one of those answers. It's just to be open. And this is why, why it's unique to RPGs is they're like people can give any answer, right? And so you kind of have to be prepared for any answer. And like, even like it, it, it's in the way that you write questions. Like even if you write leading questions, be prepared for them to un be answered in ways that are unexpected. Um, so, 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 so as much as like you can try to like lead players to water, I, I think that's a, 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 a not a, impossible task but like it's just like that shouldn't be the the, the project like, so it question should be invitations right and and like like be able to like like answer them in different ways and so I, th I think one of my most formative things in like role-playing games is it was the the no communication rule in in microscope uh which a lot of people like like uh chafe against but like i appreciate uh even though sometimes i do break it um, because it led me to things that I would not have thought otherwise. Like it, it led me to like like play when, when playing with other players, like, oh, they interpreted something on the timeline in Microsoft completely differently than how I would have like done it, right? Like, and that only came about because we didn't try to like arrive at an answer together. So that 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 came about because we we entered a space where it's like whatever answer you give to the question, I'm gonna be okay with it because you will afford the same respect to me. 
Um, so that that's a, a thing about like just coming with the attitude of like, hey, all answers are available here. And I mean, you know, within the safety rules that that you within the boundaries that you you establish, obviously. Um, but yeah, it's just like, yeah, and and like like the the shitty thing of like, hey, when you design a game, you have to be prepared for any answer to be available. Build again on the original premise of the question, like literature already invites us and asks us questions. I think the exciting thing about RPGs is that we get to answer that question and we get to live out the consequences of the answer. And I think Thomas had a really cool um, thread yesterday, depending on your time zone, um, asking what would make an interesting choice for people. And I did think about that. And for me, my answer would be choices and questions that have consequences. So this could be mechanical consequences, but in story games, usually it's also consequences for shaping your character, their motivations. And asking questions, answering that questions, you have to live with what you answer. If you said that your character um, only connects to like, um, foreigners because they feel alienated in their own hometown that shapes the rest of your play and that's what makes play experiences exciting you get to see what happens when you close the back of the book yeah um since we have uh less than five minutes left um I think I don't think really we have time for another question. So uh, why don't we get into like outros and things like that? Is there uh, like I'm really interested in what everybody's like working on right now. So uh, please like go ahead and uh, we'll again start uh, with Aaron and go in the same order. Yep. Uh, yeah. So I've been Aaron. I've We've been always been Aaron, uh, uh, and uh, you can find all my stuff on uh, uh, AaronLime.itch.io. I'm on Twitter at, at AaronLime as well. I uh, I put out an altogether different river, that, which which focuses a lot on on questions. Actually, I didn't think about like talking about it earlier. Um, nice, <laughs> uh, and also I've been doing some writing for the new uh, 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 Blades in the Dark uh, supplement for the Dagger Isles that was just announced last week. That's me, uh, Jamie. Hey, so I was Jamie. Oh my gosh, I did it. I said was also. Uh, I'll also continue to be Jamie, I think. My pronouns are he, they. And so I like like all of y'all, like every indie game designer, I'm working on several games at the same time. <laughs> that is that is just our life, right? Uh, but, a, but a particular note, I'm working on Apocalypse Keys, Once More Into the Void, our haunts some Brickwood fan games, Void Walkers that's coming out for roll. Um, oh, I feel like I'm forgetting another thing that I'm working on. But if you want to keep track of it, you can follow me on Twitter at Temporal Hiccup. You can see what games uh, come out when they're ready at temporalhiccup.itch.io. But the best way to keep track is through my Patreon. If you have the means and are interested in supporting me, you can head to patreon.com slash swordqueengames. Lately, I record videos every month for my patrons and I just talk about game design stuff so yeah that would be super super cool if you could help me out but yeah that was me and uh logan how about your lovely self thanks jeremy uh i was logan i have not all but i'm pretty sure i will continue to be logan um most recently i finished working on uh logan an autobiographical little tabletop game um yeah thank you everyone yeah, and it was yeah in an article on dicebreaker which is super super lovely uh, so yeah, that's up on my itch. Um, at the moment, it is the plain text version, but we did itch fund enough to hire uh, Jam, who's going to do some amazing, awesome layouts, which I'm super keen for. Uh, and then currently, like that's still in the works, and again, working on multiple things. Currently for uh, side quest, I'm working on volume one of the sad zines, the small and delightful zines. They're like this. Oh, the light is just very bright, but they look like, oh, there we go. So they're little, like, you know, tiny little zines with cute little things there uh yeah lyric games and so i was thinking about lyric games and what question they're more like literature and the questions that they ask that you don't necessarily answer but that's something else but yes yeah, so you can find me on breathingstories.ish.io and on twitter at ink underscore and underscore stories okay mamedos 
I am Momeros. I also continue to be Momeros and that is a good thing because that means you can look for me at momeros.com, twitter.com slash momeros, and patreon.com slash momeros where I do some tutorials like Google Sheets for character sheets and um, copywriting for Impact. In terms of RPG projects, I'm still reeling with the art Kickstarter, but if you'd love to support that, please do follow my Twitter and support indie creators ever. And across-rpgc.com. All right. And before we forget, let's go to Thomas. <laughs> yeah, I'll keep it short. Uh, I'm Thomas. Uh, you can uh, find me on Twitter at chai by post, C-H-A-I-B-Y-P-O-S-T. Thank you all for coming. Thanks Thank to Medicopia. You. Bye. <laughs>